Okay, what well, this next bit here where I do a quick review of uh, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulation uh, and Nuts algorithms here is, I guess I'm doing not so much to sort of teach you that, is to uh, identify enough on it so that to help us with the next stage here, which is to talk a bit about optimizing the sampler, uh, particularly when you encounter problems with the defaults. Uh, so you kind of need to understand the sampler a little bit at least to have some idea where you're going with that. So that, that's the main objective here, is sort of a means to an end. Uh, and so first of all, a reminder of what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulation is. Uh, it is a flavor of Monte Carlo, of Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation, uh, but using a particular approach to it. And to motivate it here, I'm using a physical analogy because that's kind of what drove the notion is, uh, you know, is this underlying way in which you can describe physical systems, you know, at least those which are describable by classical uh, mechanics, uh, can be described in terms of a Hamiltonian, uh, and you can solve those Hamiltonian equations to describe the, uh, you know, the motions of, uh, you know, of, a, of a, such a physical system, and we're going to use, leverage that notion uh, for the sampler. Okay, so the state of a system then can be, by the way, is is this where the light's getting lighter? Is that still readable? Okay. Um, you know, the state of a system can be described in terms of the kinetic energy as a function of momentum, uh, in other words, mass times velocity, and potential energy as a function of position. So it's a way of kind of uh, decomposing the, the elements uh, of motion. Uh, and for and for our analogy, we're going to equate our model parameters, which I'll describe as this vector theta. Uh, we're going to equate those to position, as we think of this as a Hamiltonian. And then there's going to be a set of auxiliary parameters that I'll call rho that we're going to equate with momentum in here. And then we're going to define a Hamiltonian in terms of our joint posterior distribution. Uh, and particularly the joint posterior distribution, not just of our parameters, but of both the parameters and those auxiliary parameters rho. So our Hamiltonian in terms of those is going to be minus the log probability here. So it's minus the log of this joint posterior density for our, the parameters we care about as well as those auxiliary parameters. I can decompose that in terms of the product here of the, uh, the posterior we really care about, the posterior in terms of theta, and this other thing here, which is the uh, density for the auxiliary parameters given the theta and, and our data y. Uh, and I guess I didn't actually say y here represents data in these equations. Uh, and since it's a log of a product, we can describe it as the sum of the logs in here. And here, so basically, we're going to have this as we can think of uh, our V here, uh, we've got our V of theta and T of rho given theta. Well, the V of theta we're going to is analogize with uh, potential energy and our T of rho given theta with kinetic energy here. And again, there, the V here is minus the log of that posterior we actually care about. And then the minus the log of the probability of rho given theta and Y, that's our kinetic energy. So it's kind of like, a, well, you know, why introduce an extra bit of complication? We've just actually made our dimensionality even bigger, but there is some value here. So first of all, theta is what we care about. That's the thing we want the posterior for. But rho allows us to use Hamiltonian mechanics to more efficiently move through the relevant parts of our parameter space. Uh, in effect, it's going to provide us with information about where the, you know, what's the right direction to move in order to move into areas of higher probability density. Uh, whereas the classic MCMC methods are more random, you know, random walk kinds of things where they, they don't really, they just go in any whatever direction and then the only thing that influences the path after that is a decision on, on whether or not to sort of stay in that new place they went to or have to come back and move elsewhere by using rejection sampling strategies as part of it. Um, the idea here is, again, try and take advantage of 
knowing a bit more about what the shape of the uh, distribution is. Uh, <coughs> so usually uh, for these methods, the distribution of rho is chosen to be independent of theta just to make it computationally easier to deal with. So for our function here, this probability of rho given theta is said, okay, let's just assume something that doesn't depend on theta. And in, the, in most of these cases, uh, a normal is used, typically a normal centered at zero with some uh, covariance matrix uh, sigma here. Uh, now, okay, so we're working with a Hamiltonian, so let's carry on our physical analogy. Let's say we put some frictionless particle on our potential energy surface here. And our potential energy surface, again, is related to it's minus the log of our, uh, of our joint, uh, joint posterior. So because I've taken minus here, uh, basically higher probability is lower value on this thing. So if you think of this as a, as a surface, maybe with gravity pulling things or something, you've got you know, you, anyway, the tendency is then higher probability is, is lower. Um, so, so we place it there. Now suppose we take that frictionless particle and we give it a shove that imparts some momentum uh, rho. And here I'm going to put an index because we're going to be working discreetly through steps here. So, in fact, I forgot to mention, we're going to start at a position theta t minus 1. Here. Uh, so we're going to move from theta t minus 1 to theta, uh, but to get there, uh, we're going we're to give this thing some random momentum uh, at that same time, t minus 1. Uh, we give that at that time. And then the particle is going to move over the surface according to Hamiltonian mechanics uh, in here. So, so this potential energy surface here is going to influence the path it takes. So, so, so the first, where you start is independent of that, but where it goes is going to be influenced by it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pick some time, we're going to pre-specify some time at which we're going to stop that particle, and we're going to stop it and measure its position, which is going to be theta, theta t at that point. And so we're going to capture that information. Now we're going to sample a new momentum from our distribution, and give the particle another shove and do that over and over again. So we, and, and in that situation, even though our initial momentum at each step is random, the subsequent path is going to favor regions of lower potential energy or equivalently higher probability density. And it turns out that the set of sample positions are distributed according to our target probability density. Albeit, since each step depends on the previous, there is going to be autocorrelation. These are they do form a Markov chain in here. <coughs> now, if we could actually solve those Hamiltonian equations exactly, we'd have an algorithm right there. We'd be done, uh, and, uh, and it'd be a wonderfully efficient algorithm, assuming you could solve those equations efficiently enough. Um, but of course, you generally can't in general. You have to solve them numerically, so they're generally solved imperfectly. Uh, so typically, another step is taken uh, at that point uh, because some error gets introduced by that numerical solution. And a metropolis step then is used to assure that, in the end, the various position samples will converge in distribution to the target distribution. So it's basically we've got an approximation of the mecha Hamiltonian mechanics that we then uh, we then correct in effect by you know it, we correct it at least in the sense of convergence in distribution uh, by using that rejection step the metropolis step. So the actual algorithm then is it based it basically is you sample. <coughs> Uh, you sample rho for the at time t minus 1 uh, from our normal zero sigma distribution here, some multivariate normal. Uh, we simultaneously update rho and, and theta by numerically solving the Hamiltonian equations using a numerical method called the leapfrog method to generate a proposal 
for the, uh, for the next position. And then we apply a Metropolis step to decide whether or not to accept that proposal. And then you do that over and over and over again. Uh, and I'll just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on these parts, but just, you know, the quick elements here. The leapfrog method is essentially a fairly simple ODE solver, uh, vaguely similar to something like the midpoint method in here, where you, where you do, so you take these steps where you do these half-step updates of, for rho and full-step updates of theta, is part of this in, in order to generate new values. And then at each HMC iteration, you repeat that some pre-specified L times to yield uh, proposal values for both theta star and rho star. So one of the things that should, well, let's see. Now I'm going to hit those on the other side, so I won't restate it. Um, then we compute this ratio. Uh, that you see here, uh, which we end up seeing is kind of a classical metropolis sort of thing here, and we accept or reject uh, this that next position with probability equal to the minimum of this ratio or one, uh, and uh, and <coughs> so where am I going here? So yeah, theta t will be that with prob that probability, and with probability one minus that you accept. In here, assuming I got that in the right direction, um, and that determines your next step. Now, rho is being sampled independently of theta, so you actually don't need to to use the previous. You can just throw that out and resample again because it's independent of theta in there. Uh, so, but so you will after you've done this. You're then going to sample a new row, start out at wherever theta t is, and then move on to the next step. Uh, now, in that, we see there's some tunable parameters in this thing. Okay, so the parameters that have to be set for this algorithm, uh, there's a discretization time in, uh, in the leapfrog step. So you can see there's basically a step size inside here. You know, so you can see epsilon going, cropping up over and over again inside there. So that's a, that's some, that's a dial you can turn. Uh, then there's uh, the number of leapfrog steps, and basically you can think of L times epsilon as kind of being equivalent to T, you know, the, the overall length of that path you're going to take. Uh, and there's the so-called mass matrix, which is actually the inverse of that, uh, uh, that covariance matrix and the thing that we sample row from. So all of those things are, can be tuned. Uh, to try and improve this, and they do make a difference in terms of the sampling efficiency. So these are a few generalities here. So if epsilon is too big, uh, basically that, that will decrease the accuracy of the Hamiltonian solution, uh, you know, the, that numerical solution of the Hamiltonian, and you'll end up rejecting too many proposals, and it gets inefficient because of that. If epsilon is too small, then the simulation times start getting very long because you're having to calculate basically your likelihood for every one of, every, every one of those little steps. Uh, so you lose efficiency that way. If L is too big, you're basically doing too much work for iteration before you actually collect the step. You know, you could easily find yourself, you know, if you made L really long, you could find yourself wandering all over this probability distribution before you stop. And, you know, basically you've taken too long a trip to get the information you want. Uh, and if L is too small, it just kind of devolves into a random walk, and you may as well use an sampler. Um, and finally, if the mass matrix is poorly tuned to the problem, you find you have to do a lot of monkeying around with epsilon and L to try and optimize things. Uh, so the way Stan tries to deal with that is through the thing called the NUTS algorithm, which stands for No U-Turn Sampler. Uh, which attempts to automatically tune those parameters during the burn-in phase. Uh, do I want? I'm actually going to skip over the, uh, the the story in these two slides is just to try and show how m the potential advantages of HMC over sort of more random walk strategies like like 
in the vanilla uh, Gibbs samplers or Metropolis Hastings. But since we're running behind, I'm going to skip over some of that. Uh, so now let's think about some limitations of all of, the, of this thing. Now, HM, you know, what I call HMC issues and limitations here. Uh, one is that the algorithm requires calculation of the gradient of your posterior with respect to all of your model parameters. And that can be a fairly expensive calculation. So what that means is basically uh, you, each iteration is more expensive than, say, like a Gibbs sampler. On the other hand, the sampler is more efficient in terms of the amount of information you get from, you know, from a from a given number of uh, iterations, a given number of samples compared to uh, a Gibbs sampler or Metropolis Hastings. So there's a trade-off here in terms of where what the net efficiency is. Um, so, but another thing issue here is that great one of the reasons for the great sorry where am I going here one issue with the requiring gradients is it means it's suitable for sampling of continuous parameters only uh, so you can't sample discrete parameters uh, and it just it just qualify that that's only true for parameters you can have discrete data so I can model you know discrete data of, of all various kinds uh, in that sense the likelihood is describing the likelihood for discrete data, but the parameters upon which that likely depend, likelihood depends must be continuous in order to use the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, and in some cases where you've got models with discrete parameters like finite mixture models, you can often implement those by marginalizing out the discrete parameters so that the ones you actually work with are continuous. But it is a potential limitation. Uh, just a brief thing on the automatic parameter tuning that happens in nuts here. So it tries to optimize the discretization time, that epsilon, by, by trying to adjust the, basically trying to adjust epsilon to match some target acceptance rate. And the default acceptance rate is 0.8, but that's something you can adjust if you want. Uh, it estimates the, mace ma ma the ma mass matrix based upon warm-up samples as it goes along. Uh, it dynamically samples the number of leaps frog steps throughout the sampling using the, uh, the NUTS algorithm and seeks to maximize the distance traversed between paths before the path doubles back on itself, thus the notion of no U-turn. So, because the argument, you know, like I mentioned, if you set L, you know, particularly large, you could end up with a situation where this thing is going all, moving all around your, your space here, essentially doubling back on itself who knows how many times, and, you know, doing a lot more work than necessary uh, to get the same amount of information. So it attempts to characterize that notion. It, you know, they get specific about what they mean by a U-turn, uh, but it tries to characterize that. And now that's actually something that happens even during the sampling strategy. It even goes beyond the burn-in phase. Um, and then the comment that users can override any of these automatic settings by explicitly uh, setting those parameters. And though we'll, in a couple of case, specific cases, we'll hit on a couple of them. But to really see details, uh, point you to this is the Stan User's Guide that goes through that in some detail. So uh, one question, if you have time, could you please? Uh, explain a little bit uh, how the mass matrix is estimated from the amount of samples. Uh, I don't know. No, no. Yeah, I, at least I couldn't. Uh, I, I couldn't put it out for you. Yeah, I would. I'll. I'll leave that to the documentation. Okay, so and what I wanted to use that anyway as motivation for things we're going to optimize. In particular, one of the reasons I'm I'm going to I, I was sort of loosely said the I don't know part, but one of the things I'm not going to try and adjust during this will be the mass matrix. We'll let uh, Stan take care of that, but there's a couple of the other things that we will actually adjust uh, as part of our effort to sort of optimize Stan code. So, okay, so a few things here. So non-optimal Stan code can result in computational efficiency and sampling problems. You know, things like poor convergence and mixing, 
You know, it just takes too many samples to get adequate convergence and too many post burning samples to get adequate numbers of effect, you know, effective sample sizes. Uh, and then we had earlier on briefly hit on this idea of divergent transitions. And basically, I mean, do I? Let me see if I say a little more on this. I don't remember if I did, but I'll mention it here anyway. The, the notion of a divergent transition means you've, you've got a situation where that numerical solution to the, uh, uh, to the Hamiltonian not only fails, but kind of fails catastrophically. And, and Stan attempts to identify when that happens. Uh, and if so, it reports them out as so-called divergent transitions. Now, what happens is basically it rejects those transitions and tries again in there. But there's always the risk that it's having trouble getting to, you know, a relevant part of the posterior uh, that it can't just can't get to because it's it's failing to deal with it. This can happen in cases where you have a things like a mix of strong nonlinearities and maybe some really sharp changes. Uh, in the shape of the posterior that's happening so that you know maybe you've got a posterior where at some point you've got this really sharp ridge or something inside there and the Hamiltonian because the epsilons may be too big or something it just can't seem to you know make its way around that sharp ridge you know instead it just shoots off into some other part of the space that really has little to do with the true trajectory of the Hamiltonian. Um, and again, as I say, Stan attempts to identify those cases, and if it does, it reports them out that way. Anyway, and there's, and we'll talk briefly about some strategies for trying to remedy that. Uh, do I want to read that whole thing? Probably not. It's just basically making the argument here that, uh, you know, about what a well-behaved Stan program looks like in terms of the sampling outcomes that you see, and if you see things that don't meet these sorts of things, you know, it points out that sometimes the algorithm can get stuck in a part of the posterior, typically due to very high curvature of some kind uh, you know, within it, where it kind of gets stuck into some space, and and that kind of sticking usually is an indicator that you may need to. Uh, do some reparameterization to deal with that. Um, it also mentions that sometimes you can get around it instead by changing some of these sampling parameters, like uh, reducing the initial step size so that uh, so that you know it, it can by just simply shrinking the step size be able to navigate some of that sharp curvature within there. So. Improving computational strategy and sampling. So the main strategies for some of this is for simple computational efficiency uh, that has actually relatively little to do with the, the sampler per se, uh, but has more to do with the rest of the calculations would be vectorization, particularly of any of the likelihood statements or anything that involves a stochastic part of the model. Uh, Reparameterization. Uh, to deal with problems where maybe in the in the standard parameterization you may be dealing with some really difficult shaped uh, posteriors and sometimes that can help relieve that. Uh, directly adjusting some of the HMC tuning parameters yourself. Uh, another aspect here that we'll talk a bit about is, uh, and this is particularly true for hierarchical models like population models, is it's in many cases, the argument here is that, you know, though you may be thinking uh, that you don't know something about some of these things, maybe you actually know more than you think you do, if you like. That's, not, that's a silly statement. But, but, the, but in some cases, there's good arguments for using some weakly informative priors instead of highly uninformative priors for things like inter-individual vari variation, you know, the inter-individual standard deviations. Uh, to regularize the fitting of those models, because otherwise, what you'll often find is that, um, you know, if you give severely uninformative priors to things like uh, the inter-individual standard deviations, is you'll often find that it has an extremely difficult time with sampling uh, uh, in there, particularly if the number of individuals uh, that are subject to that inter-individual variability is small. 
OK, so let's see. I think I've kind of said this already. So vectorized calculations can speed up calculations, and <laughs> particularly true for probability functions. OK, reparameterization is, is this main strategy. Well, there's two strategies we're going to look at for dealing with, as I say, the pesky divergent transitions. Um, and I sort of reiterate the comment. I think I've kind of hit on this already. So it occurs when that leech leapfrog integrator fails. And so there's uh, a few different things to do with it. Uh, OK, one is to increase the target acceptance rate, the so-called ADAPT delta. In fact, if you look at the, uh, the printouts that you get, you know, the, what, the information that gets printed out for a, um, for a run where you have divergent transitions, it will actually tell you about the I, you know, tell you you have X number of divergent transitions. And I forget the exact wording, but something to the effect of consider changing ADAPT delta 2. And it'll say something other than whatever the default value is or whatever value you tried before. So, so that's one of the things to attempt. Uh, another strategy is to decrease the initial step size uh, as part of that or some combination of the two. Uh, and others are where we get into reparameterizations. One of the more common ones is switching from a so-called centered to a non-centered uh, parameterization, or in some cases, the reverse of that. Uh, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, and then there's sometimes other reparameterizations that can reduce posterior curvature. You know, so for example, we saw before a model like an Emacs model where Emacs and EC50, if you look at that bivariate distribution, they were real strongly correlated. And if you put that into the context of the full posterior, that would probably look like a nasty little ridge in there uh, that if, you know, depending on the severity of that ridge, it might be something that both the sampler and the ODE solver may struggle to deal with. And there are reparameterizations to deal with that that are different from the, the notion here of the centered and non-centered. So we're going to explore sort of these first two things here because they tend to generalize more, whereas this, in the other case, the reparameterizations tend to be more model specific. <laughs> okay, and we're going to take two cases. We'll take a look at a univariate case and, uh, and then a multivariate case. Uh, the univariate case here is going to be one where basically we're going to go back to that old factor 10a inhibition results, but now we're going to keep the individual. We're not going to time average and we'll take, keep the individual uh, values uh, in there and we'll just use, and we'll model the time match values and use a fairly simple hierarchical model. Uh, for dealing with that. So that's so we're looking at data that, you know, viewed on a per dose basis looks like this. If you lump them all together, they look like that. But keep in mind that each individual contributes multiple points to, to what you see over there. Um, we're going to use a sigmoid EMAX model. Uh, simple normal residual variability, and we're going to stick one random effect on here. We're just going to put it on EC50. Part of this, uh, and not terribly, uh, well, I think these are more or less the same priors I think we used before, so uh, that's not the interesting part in this. Okay, so let's take a look at that. So we start out with the first one, this FXA inhibit 1. And let's scoot to um, well. Actually, the more the most relevant part here. Let's go right to the the relevant part, and that's in here. So we're just going to do this like we would normally think of this if we were writing this out in a you know in a paper or something. You know, we're just going to have write out EC50. In this case, I'm going to do it as log of EC50 as normal with a mean log EC50 hat and some standard deviation omega. OK, so this, is the, this would be what we would call the centered parameterization. We've got this distribution centered at its mean. Uh, so we're, gonna do, we're going to use that for our inter-individual variability and our EC50. 
and proceed with that. Now, if we do that, let's go ahead and pull up our R, the corresponding R script. Oh, Jump the gun there. In here, uh, let me make sure I'm still. Uh, actually, let's do it this way. Let me make sure I'm still where I need to be here. clear out some of this mess here. Ah, it's not letting me get there. Okay, well, we'll just leave it be. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead. Oh, except I need to make sure I'm still in the right place. Okay, I'm still in the right place. Let's just go ahead and run it. I don't think this one, other than waiting for it to compile, I don't think it takes too horribly long in here. So the main point here is assuming nothing's changed here, it'll generate some divergent transitions in here, and I just want that to be visible. Actually, while it's monkeying around there, let's actually show you something that'll let you see at least one aspect of that. And then when it's done, we can so you can see the full printout. See, inhibit one, yes, okay. Let's move to, okay, this is what I want you to see. So this is one where, if you look, you'll see a few of these red ticks along the bottom, which co correspond to divergent transitions, you know, indicated, okay, at least around those points, it was having some trouble uh, navigating, uh, navigating the posterior for some reason. Now, whether it was severe enough to, you know, to, you know, cause any major problems is always fuzzy in any case. Depends who you talk to. When I talk to the folks in the stand group, uh, if you talk to uh, uh, Mike Betancourt, who's the one mainly responsible for putting together the code for the HMC stuff, uh, he'd tell you any divergent transitions, it's wrong. You've got to fix it. Uh, you'll talk to some of the others who'll use a softer, you know, softer reference. You know, if they see one or two, it's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, so depends who you want to believe there. Okay, so you see them there, but I also wanted to, so you could see what, uh, yeah. up there, so you can see what it actually says when it happens. Okay, see, notice here, there were 16 divert. Uh, I got to let it do the other stuff, because... It doesn't let me sit still. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, I know you're going to do another one. Really? It's just a plot. Come on, there you go. Come on. I mean, it's a few plots, but okay. Let's go back there because I wanted you to see the entire statement here. Okay, so you can see it says there were 16 divergent transitions after warm up, increasing adapt delta above 0.8, which is the default, and we only use the default, uh, you know, may help. So, and then it sends you off to that same reference I gave you in there to, to read about it. Uh, figuring out other things in here. So, you know, it also tells you to examine the pairs plot to see if that helps you diagnose any of the problems. Uh, and the reason why is the pairs plot will highlight any of the samples where there are divergent transitions in red. Uh, okay, so fine, we'll take them at their word. Let's adjust our, uh, let's adjust our adapt delta and see what that does for us. And I believe that's Oh, actually, I don't think I do that. Okay, so let's make sure this wasn't one. I Sometimes I've left the one here that I'm looking in the wrong file. Doesn't help. Uh, make sure this one I didn't already adjust it. Sometimes I do. I already did. Okay, well, actually, why did it say point? Oh, no, I commented it out. Okay, so, you know, so what I'm doing here is getting rid of the, where I commented that out. 
So I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. <laughs> Usually, I you know the usual thing is after 0.8 doesn't work. I try 0.9 and then 0.95. And if you see a progression where it's actually decreasing uh, the uh, the number of divergent transitions by you know a, a reasonable amount, or, you know or whatever you know a substantial amount, then I might continue down that path. But sometimes what you find is that just you know any reasonable value you throw at just doesn't do it. In which case we resort to reparameterization. But for example, okay, I didn't do something right. Why are these little red things there? Oh, probably because I forgot to get rid of the. There we go. Come on. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and redo it real quick with that. It compiles. So I don't think I don't think it'll recompile. So hopefully that'll be a little quicker. Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what it thought I changed, but whatever. Okay, because if if it, it it tries to detect whether something changed uh, in there, and if it doesn't, it it accepts and move, it takes what was compiled before. Okay, let's let that puddle along here. Uh, so let's say that any way that that doesn't adequately reduce my divergent transitions and I need to do something more. The next logical step here would be to go to the non-centered parameterization. And that is, where do we go here? Right here. Our factor, uh, FXA inhibit 1 NCP. And when you hang around stand geeks, you hear NCP a lot. That means non-centered parameterization. So um, it took me a while to wonder they would be talking. I was like, "What are they talking about?" Anyway, okay. So, and actually, what I really want to look at is the uh, the model. And there it is. Okay. Most of the model is the same as before. The key difference happens. Well, it shows up in a couple of places. Uh, instead of having the individual a, a parameter that corresponds to the individual EC50 values, I instead have a thing called eta. And, you know, being mostly non-MEM users out there, I imagine you know what eta's are, okay? Uh, eta's are these things which are centered at zero. But in addition, we're going to push it further. These eta's are standard normals. They're normal zero ones in here. And that crops up down here. So I'm going to write out the model in terms of, instead of having this thing showing a sampling statement for EC50 directly, I'm going to instead generate these normal 0, 1s and generate the EC50s indirectly. And I stuck that back up here uh, in our transform parameters where the EC50 is going to be then EC50 times e to the eta times the omega EC50. So this would be like, I mean, you can actually do that kind of thing, and some folks like to do this in, in non-MEM, where I would specify an eta uh, with a fixed distribution, a fixed omega of 1, uh, and, and I would specify you know, my individual parameter in terms of the, you know, the, the typical value and the standard deviation. Particularly if I'm trying to say model the standard deviation as a as a theta instead of an eta or an omega, whatever. Um, okay, so that's a non-centered parameterization for the univariate case. And let's go back to our old buddy here. Did it finish? Yeah, it finished. Let's see what it did do here. Well, it, it knocked them down. We get, it knocked them down to two by when I jumped to 0.95. Uh, so, mm, you know, but let's say we're not happy with that. Let's say we're Mike Bancourt. Okay, so uh, that's when I would go ahead and do the, uh, the non-centered parameterization for this. And we'll go ahead and just for fun, let's go ahead and run it.
I must have had that one sitting in, in the background somewhere. So when you have two uh, divergent uh, transitions, does it mean that two out of your thousand samples are invalid? Or is it all the chains after the... the well, the risk, okay, yeah, technically, the, in a sense, it could mean only that, and in which case it would be like a big deal. Uh, or it could mean that for some reason it's unable to get to a part of the uh, part of the posterior. So you can end up with a situation there where you know it, because it can't get past this really sharp cusp or something in your in your posterior, it never gets there. And if it never gets there, it may miss it may never explore a relevant part of your posterior. So that that's kind of the risk. You know that's that would be in there. Now I would still say if you've only got two, I really, you know, but uh, but that is at least the potential risk. Okay, we're doing that again. Um, earlier, the, one of the comments of the health warnings was that they suggested to look at the pairs plot. What kind of um, well? It may or may not help you a lot, tell you the truth, at least in the cases I've looked at. Okay, so for example, let's see, is this the right one? Uh, yeah. Of course, I think this will become, let's see. So let's make sure I'm actually, in, I've got the right thing. Yeah, okay, so. Always takes a bit to come up. So they're actually, because there weren't all that many in here, it's hard, really hard to see, especially up here. Uh, but you'll see some little red dots in here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you'll they'll show up in places that are obviously near boundaries or something that, you know, they're really suggestive that it's not able to get someplace and might be diagnostic. In this case, they're kind of all dotted right around in the middle of stuff. So, it, I'm so for this particular instance, it's probably not very useful in diagnostic of anything. Uh, but again, it, it highlights those as red dots. But you're mostly looking to see whether it's somewhere out, uh, out of the boundaries of these. Uh, that could be boundaries. part of it, yeah. Okay. okay, and let's see if we succeeded. Uh, let's see. Oh, interesting. Well, that didn't help me any. Uh, okay. Yeah, I seem to, I should have remembered this one. This one actually I still had some even if I after I did the parameterization. As I recall, if you knock up the adapt delta, uh, that you do the combination of the two, that finally rids you of them. Uh, because again, we're running behind. I'm going to skip over that, but I encourage you to take a peek at that uh, because the next step is showing you how to deal with it in the multivariate case, which frankly is going to be more common, I think, for most of us. So let's see what's involved in that. Let's get rid of some of this. Uh, okay. That's what I want. Yeah, let's clear the decks a little. And yeah, let's go to the next. Okay, now if we're dealing with the non-centered parameterization, we have to have something in here to take go from our standard normals to uh, to a multivariate normal, and the classic way of dealing with that is via the Kolesky decomposition uh, of our covariance matrix to do that. So that's exactly what we're going to do uh, in this case in order to take our our eta's here, our normal, uh, our standard normals, and generate our individual parameter estimates that are coming from a multivariate normal. Uh, in the example we're going to look at in this is going to be taking our that multi-dose PK1, and if you recall, we did have some, um, we did have some divergent transitions in that, and show you how you would do the uh, uh, do the non-centered parameterization for that. Uh, now, the first thing it actually shows you is the centered parameterization, which is the way we've already done it before, except before I didn't do 
Did I do this? In yeah, I did that in person, but let me pull it up just to compare them. And then we've got one that's called the uh, multi-dose PK-1 NCP. Uh, so let's pull up the function. Multi-dose PK-1 or PK-1 torsten 2. Okay, that must be this guy. Okay, now most of this is the you know, like before we did the multi-dose PK-1, so, and, uh, and it, in fact, we did the initial Torsten one, too. So you've seen sort of that implementation in here. Actually trying to remember what's different about two compared to one. I honestly don't remember um, why two is different than one. Sorry, while I take a quick peek. You know, it might not even be different now that I think of it. it. May just be that I stuck it in here again. Okay, but anyway, the let's go back down to to the model, and so kind of the main point here is this: using the multivariate normal distribution and specifying the you know that vector mean here for for the multivariate normal. That's a centered parameterization because the sampling is centered on the, the the actual means for the quantities we're trying oops, the quantities we're trying to generate. Uh, so again, if I get divergent transitions there and monkeying with the DAP delta or the step size doesn't seem to, to remedy that, then we can attempt the non-centered parameterization for that. And that looks like uh, let's see, that would be this guy. Okay, uh, much of this looks the same as before, but then when we look at parameters, there's a few things that change here. Where is it? Okay. So, well, first of all, the main one I point out is down here. <coughs> We're now going to have a bunch. These things, these eta's, are going to ultimately be generated as uh, as um, as just independent uh, standard normals. And we're going to stick a bunch of independent standard normals into this matrix structure here to facilitate some of the later calculations uh, that we'd be doing. So, so we've got that. Uh, and then part of the path here is uh, to facilitate the calculations again involving the Koleski decomposition is instead of specifying the um, the correlation matrix directly, we're going to do it indirectly through a through the Koleski decomposition of that correlation matrix in here, and they actually have a a uh, variable type for that Koleski factor core uh, in here. And there is a corresponding LKJ version for populating that thing. So we will be specifying a prior bait for that thing. Uh, omega stays the same. So that's our vector of uh, in, inter-individual standard deviations in here. And then if we come down to, where do I want to do this? Well, let me first point out, uh, make you dizzy there. Let's see. Okay, down here, uh, so first of all, as I commented, uh, there is such a thing as this LJK core Koleski, which will populate that Koleski decomposition of the, uh, of that, of the correlation matrix. And then uh, here is where we're generating our a bunch of normal zero ones, standard normals. And notice I can actually stick this on the left-hand side. I'm taking what's a matrix, but I, in effect, I temporarily convert that to a vector in order to shove all of, to fill up all of those etas. But the eta itself will remain a uh, will remain a, a matrix in here. So anyway, these are we're, we're getting at the stage of tricks, if you like, uh, for dealing with some of this stuff. <laughs> okay, so that's where the stochastic part of it happens. Uh, but then we got to put it all together. 
And okay, where'd we go? Okay, here's where all, all of this, some of this mess happens. So instead of having our statement before where we you know, generate our, uh, co our covariance matrix and then use the, the multivariate normal, uh, instead, and this is all a commented thing here, instead where I'm going to generate my thetas here by taking the etas, multiplying them by that Koleski decomposition of our uh, Koleski decomposition of the correlation, both pre and post multiplying that with my standard deviations. And this mess right here, uh, this mess right here is, is basically generating uh, let's see, I got too many things going on here. It's basically dealing with the part where I, um, in effect, multiply the standard deviations times these etas. So, that, so that would, that's kind of the multivariate equivalent of what we did uh, with that univariate case. Uh, and finally, having to scale them according to the population, the typical values in here. And that whole mess is a long-winded way of basically generating this multivariate log normal here for theta. So this only works with uncorrelated? Uh, Pardon? No, no. This is uh, the, the end result is correlated because keep in mind the correlations are captured by the Koleski decomposition of this uh, uh, the, of the correlation matrix. So the inter-individual random effects are correlated. But you're generating the values using uncorrelated standard normals. Basically, this is the this is the typical way in which this kind of thing is done under the hood for multivariate normal samples, and it's kind of forcing you to, you know, to look under the hood if you like uh, to deal with it here. Um, another kind of thing that hopefully in our our uh, our package for pre-processing we can sort of bury this under the hood so you're not having to deal with it directly. But it is but this is the way to deal with the multivariate non-centered distribution case. Okay, having done that, and I get these do take a while, the population ones take a while to run. So the main thing I would say here is uh, on your own time, <laughs> yeah, go ahead and run these and you should see uh, the distinction between the two cases where the original one, recall, we did see uh, divergent transitions. And either this alone or this plus some adjustment in adapt delta is sufficient to remove them uh, for this population modeling case. OK, so that's, Let's see, what else did I, I'm trying to remember if I hit on any other strategies in here. Let me double check. Yeah, okay, so those were kind of the main strategies I was trying to hit on for, you know, for doing some optimization of the sampling when you run into some of these kinds of problems uh, with the sampler. Uh, the other thing I wanted to have was a little discussion on prior distributions. Because uh, they play, they can play a few couple of different roles in here. Uh, you know, in in one case, you know, well, actually, rather than that's presaging where I'm going to go. Let me go ahead and sort of stick with the the train that I've got here. So, okay, so first of all, uh, one recommendation is think of prior distributions as part of your model. You know, these are not sort of nuisance items that you got to play with. They're they're really part of the overall uh, portions of your models. Uh, they should be chosen and subjected to scrutiny, much like your other model components. Uh, model checking ideally should include some sensitivity analyses of those priors uh, to understand how influential they are. You know, if you think you're being uninformative, then are they? You know, by by confirming that with sensitivity analysis, or if they are intended to be informative, make sure you under, understand the amount of influence they're having. Um, as a comment here, choice of priors tend to be most critical with sparse or limited data for the obvious reason that uh, your data have, you know, are basically providing less information about the parameters, so the priors have a much greater chance of being influential on your parameter estimates. 
Uh, I point to a reference here, uh, actually a, a site that some of the folks that um, involved with Stan have put together about priors and, uh, and making choices on them. And for the most part, I've kind of drunk their Kool-Aid, so I, I, will, I tend to be reflecting some of that. Would the, would the fairly say that Bayesian analysts are typically uh, biased towards having more uninformative than informative? Um, it probably depends on who you talk to. Uh, if you buy the El Andy Gelman uh, Kool-Aid, uh, it would be, or drink it, I'm mixing my metaphors. Um, you know, I would say probably the other way around. Uh, it depends on where the priors come into the model. Uh, but certainly for things like uh, hierarchical models where you have these, uh, I like in you know, where you have variances associated with the random effects. Uh, if anything, he would probably argue for being more informative, if for no other reason to than to just sort of regularize the, uh, the estimation process. Um, and that's kind of where, where we're going here is, uh, I mean, there's a couple reasons, what, you know, a couple of functions then for the prior. Uh, it's the classic function, and probably the most important one, would be to represent prior knowledge. You know, where you, you really want to uh, synthesize, you know, both, you know the, both your prior knowledge with new data and to have your results reflect some mixture of both. Uh, and that's still, the, you know, still, you know, king of that stuff. Uh, but you may also want to use it to regularize, uh, so some regularization to facilitate the computations. Um, Typically, in those cases, you're using things which not, would not be strongly informative. They would be, I guess, what I would call something in the range of weakly to moderate, moderately informative. Uh, for example, you might do things like choose a Cauchy distribution, which is a very heavy tail distribution, uh, where the bulk of the probability density is in a range that, you, that, based on whatever prior knowledge you have, you think is the likely place you know, is where the prior, sort of, you know, the region that the prior will fall into, but you're sort of um, hedging your bets a bit by using this heavy tail distribution, so it doesn't preclude learning something from your data that suggests that maybe there's a problem with your prior. So that's kind of loosely the notion there. Um, you know, so that's one side of it. Another side of it is, frankly, we kind of know that, you know, for most of the kinds of contexts we're working in, you know, we're, first of all, we're usually modeling most of our uh, inter-individual variability on log normals, so that the standard deviation that we're looking at is usually something that's roughly a, a CV in here. And, you know, the, the idea that you're likely to have a meaningful result that's like a CV of 200 plus percent, chances are something went wrong. You know, that's probably not a true reflection in most contexts. Now, there may be exceptions, but that for most of the contexts we're working in, those are not very plausible. So it's not unreasonable to constrain things a bit by using priors uh, that make that an unlikely outcome. Uh, okay, so, so another thing is, is when we talk about these things, and there's probably different people with different levels of bias here in terms of how they would do this, but, uh, but I'll say, you know, the question is, what does it mean to be informative, uninformative, weakly informative, and so on? I personally don't think those things are particularly well-defined, and so I'm just going to make an attempt at some kind of loose definitions so we have a rough idea what we're talking about. You know, when I say it, you have a rough idea what I'm thinking. Uh, because I probably only have a rough idea of what I'm thinking. Um, so weakly informative prior, meaning a prior that sort of, sort of rules out really unreasonable uh, parameter values, but isn't so strong as to rule out values that might make some kind of sense. So that talking about loose. You know, so uh, you know. So again, it's that kind of notion where I'm. I want you know. I'm trying to keep it so that the values are plausible based upon whatever prior knowledge I may have in here, but I don't want to keep them so sharp as to be overly influential on the outcomes. I want to allow the possibility that the data is going to be telling me something else. Uh, informative prior, 
uh, <laughs> you know, when I really say it without a qualification, I'm probably also meaning what you might call strongly informative. I mean, a prior that purposely represents information intended to influence the posterior. So that means I'm trying to capture things like prior knowledge, or in some cases, I may be deliberately trying to challenge my analysis by seeing what happens under competing prior assumptions in here. For example, using some sort of a pessimistic or optimistic prior to see how that influences the inference I would make uh, from this analysis. Uh, you know, again, it's part, you can think of that again as kind of a sensitivity analysis in here. Uh, and then there's the notion of an uninformative prior. Uh, ostensibly, that's a prior that represents no information uh, and therefore, you know, as I say, lets the data tell the story. Um, you know, so for example, you might use an, an improper prior like a constant value over the entire real line uh, in here. And for some contexts where, you know, the, you know, the data are going to clearly dominate the thing anyway, those are probably perfectly reasonable, uh, or, you know, especially if it's not a hier hierarchical model. Uh, but when we get into hierarchical models, those things are often rather problematic. And if you're not careful, you can even end up with situations where uh, the true posterior would also be improper, which would be useless. Uh, so, so those are things I, I tend to avoid unless they really make particular sense. Um, and I, here I give sort of a cautionary point here is, you know, beware that an uninformative prior might really not be. Uh, and I give the example of suppose I use an improper prior for a uh, standard deviation, something that has to be only on the uh, positive real line. Okay, and so I do that where I just treat it as a constant. Well, that means all positive values are equally likely, but it, you know, and that sounds like a pretty reasonable definition of uninformativeness, right? But think about it. That means that the prior is assigning infinitely more probability to, to, to a value, to any value you pick, pick any non-negative value. Uh, and you'll find that when you integrate that thing, there's infinitely more probability to the right of whatever value you pick than there is to the left. Because the left has a finite probability, the right has an infinite probability, which is kind of a nonsense notion anyway. But uh, but in a relative terms, it's, it's infinite to the right. So that means, you know, so that kind of that means that it's almost certainly going to bias the posterior for that value to high values, uh, no matter what you try to do with that. And it, it, so I'm arguing that in a context like that, it's not automatically conferring, you know, uninformativeness in this case because you're telling me no matter what I think my, you know, I think my you know, my standard deviation or my variance is, is bigger than whatever value you dream up. Okay, so anyway, just a cautionary tale uh, when you get to that. Now, there are strategies for so-called uninformative uh, standard deviations or variances that try to get around that notion. Um, but I must admit, I, I tend to be biased towards using something that it's least, is at least weakly uninformative. Sorry, weakly informative. Okay, so I think that was, yeah, that was kind of the tale I wanted to tell about, about priors at this point. Uh, and in particular, you'll probably, if you look at the various hierarchical models, the population models that I've done in here, you'll see that I tend to use, again, what I would call, you know, moderately to weakly informative priors for those standard deviations, the things I've been calling omegas here. Uh, you know, they... They do things like, you know, I think most of them I was using things like half normal, zero, what was I using, you know, zero one, zero twos, and that, which are basically saying, I think these values are going, you know, I think with fairly high probability, these values are somewhere less than 200%, but, again, I've got big enough, you know, there's a possibility that they're going to wander above that. Would you even use highly informative priors instead of fixed values in the model? Uh, well, that's almost certainly true. Uh, you know, there might be cases where the distinction between those values that would be highly informative and those that are much less informative, you know, where the, 
distinction is so great that it might not make much difference. And I might say, just to reduce the dimensionality, I won't bother. Uh, and I might just use a fixed value. But for the most part, I would tend to use uh, informative priors instead of fixing them. It's also the notion that uh, I think Bob Bauer tries to convey when using the resampling engines is that you know, hitting towards sort of a flexibility. If you give it a little bit of flexibility so it can move around, but it's sitting in its prior, uh, then it helps, gives a little bit of flexibility for the mold to reverse. And Bob uses that paradigm when you have fixed um, ETAS, he'd rather mm -hmm. fix that to say 10, 50%. Standard deviation rather than fixing it to zero. Mm -hmm. So you give a little bit of flexibility. Would that be an argument in modeling to give a little bit of flexibility using the informative prior rather than saying it's this? Not sure. Um, I'm not gonna. I haven't thought about it in those mm -hmm. terms. So the strength of that argument also is like around the um, new model. Yeah, because the new model you can't converge unless it can move a little bit in that distribution and has mm -hmm. to fall back to. Mm -hmm. You're right, you're that's where you suggest that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. haven't touched it. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> so, quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so, a, uh, a uniform distribution it might be bad. You're using Cauchy in many cases, mm -hmm. which has an infinite variance also, but, um, but I guess it's just that it has a uh, defined mean. Uh, it has a defined mean, and you have a depth, you know, and you definitely know where most of the probability density is, right. even though the the variance would be infinite. Uh, but then I'm not trying to estimate its variance anyway. Now, sure. I, what I would not do is I would not do something like try to model the interindividual variability as Cauchy. Okay, okay. Uh, I would probably reserve that for things like priors. But... Yeah. On the other hand, I have occasionally resorted to t distributions. For um, for inter individual variability, and I guess if you push that to the limit, you can end up in a coach and chip down. Okay, um, where did we officially put our break here? Actually, we only kind of just got here, didn't we? Why don't we, why don't we give it another half hour here and we'll, before we do a little break? So, um, so kind of okay. We hit on that. What I think what I wanted, yeah, where I wanted to go next is our belated uh, hands-on example two. And whether we make it hands-on or not, I'll leave up to you. You can kind of play with it here. But I just mainly wanted to give an example of how you can use the next one. Well, in fact, the next two come sort of one right after the other, one illustrating how to implement a model with a linear ODE using Torsten, and another one illustrating how to implement a nonlinear ODE system of ODEs in, um, in Torsten. So they're. And I kept them fairly simple. I'm not even doing population stuff here. These are just single individuals because I just wanted to illustrate the um, that aspect, just implementing the models, you know, the core model using Torsten in these. So we've actually seen this problem when I talked about the um, using the matrix exponential before. So we're going to use uh, Torsten's lin ODE model function instead of using the matrix exponential directly. Under the hood, that's what it's doing, though. It's using the matrix exponential. Uh, so it's our you know, two-compartment model plus an effect compartment with an Emacs uh, effect you know, uh, condition on the uh, effect compartment concentration. Uh, we've got our model specified in terms of the rate constant matrix in this case. Uh, and you've seen this already. Uh, the only difference that really shows up in this is our, you know, it's the names of our model and our script here. So let's move right to that. Uh, let's knock those guys off. Okay. Oh, actually, what, I did that and I forgot what I called them. Effect environment single patient torsten. Okay. Okay, so that's right here. Uh, the first parts of this, um, you've kind of seen most of this where I'm passing in data, uh, you know, in terms of essentially non mem like elements in here. 
Uh, so as before, so this is pretty much the same. I've got number of events, uh, the number of events that contain uh, my observed values, the indices of the observed values, and then uh, the various you know components here: time, EVID, amount, and so on, down to SS, all with that have uh, NT values in them, and then my observed concentrations and my observed responses. Uh, in this case. Uh, in this particular case, I actually structured the data so that the observed responses uh, were, uh, were at all points, including the, uh, including the uh, dosing events. So that's rather non non Um uh, We're going to, let's see, I did log normal on the concentration. So we're taking a log transformation here. Got four compartments. And again, I'm not going to try to estimate F and T lag. So I'm just going to fix those to ones and zeros. Uh, this would actually, the first part of this is more or less identical. I did a little trick here um, that just illustrates how you can uh, do some interesting transformations using the boundary uh, conditions that you put on these things in this line. It's a rather messy looking one, uh, but basically what I've I've done here is I'm uh, I'm taking the uh, the values here and insisting that k basically this is saying that ka is going to be greater than lambda one, which in this case is the bigger of the two lambda. Yeah, it's the bigger of the two lambdas, if you like. So it's basically forcing this not to uh, to, to flip flop at all. Now, you can do it without that, but you get some odd parameter aliasing that tends to happen if you don't enforce that. Uh, and I guess the question is, is whether you want to buy the assumption, but it is an assumption. So that's just a trick here to use the, in this case, the lower bound as a strategy uh, to actually enforce that constraint. Uh, there's other ways of doing it. I could have instead parameterized this in terms of the difference between Ka and lambda 1. And you know, and, and just required to be greater than zero. Uh, but I surprisingly enough, I found this to be a little better behaved than that. And even though it's messy to write, it's in some ways in my head more intuitive. Uh, let's see what else is in here. Okay, transform parameters is where we have the stuff going on with our uh, with our torsten function. Okay, so I've got the usual things. I got my C hat, C E hat, and response hat all done there. Uh, and I've got my X that's going to contain my compartmental amounts, and my K, which is my rate constant matrix. Uh, and you saw this before, where I initialize the rate constant matrix to zero, and then fill in the non-zero elements. By the way, there's other ways. Some people like writing this. You can actually write this out in a way where you can explicitly see the matrix. So I can use the, uh, you know, the sort of open and close bracket, uh, or not bra uh, brace kind of notation to actually write out the entire matrix where you can kind of see the, all, where all the elements fit in there and make it real pretty. Uh, I find this easier anyway, but it's whatever your preference is. It just makes less of a nice picture. Uh, and then finally, instead of the calculation we did before, uh, where we explicitly called the matrix exponential uh, in here. I've done it instead using our lin ODE model in here. So this is, it looks very much like you saw with the one and two compartment model, uh, except the, uh, so the first arguments all stay the same. Where it changes is down here. There's no longer a params component. Instead, we have the rate constant matrix. So instead of params FT lag, you have K FT lag. So basically, the params becomes this very specific structure, this square matrix that you pass in there. And that's really the fundamental difference uh, in the whole thing. Uh, if we, let's see, down here, I don't think there's anything new. No, there's nothing really new uh, in all of this. That's all same old, same old. Uh, and then, let's see, I don't even, yeah, because I, because this is not a hierarchical model, I don't have a distinction between individual and, 
population predictions, so I never, I don't even need to call the function, the, uh, the, the our linear function here anymore. Here, I just go ahead and generate, uh, generate my predictions directly from the C hats and response hats I've already calculated. And this one, this was only a single individual, right? In theory, it shouldn't even take very long. Uh, it's been a while since I ran this one, so I don't remember how long. OK, what did I call it? The fact is. Just for fun, I'll go ahead and run that here because we're going to take a, well, we may not take a break right away. Still give it a few more minutes. I'll let that crunch. We can call it, well, this is supposed to be hands-on example, too. So if you actually wanted to run that, in theory, it should run OK. And other than it shouldn't take too long since it's just a single individual. While it's plugging along, let's lead into the next one. Get a little bit caught up. Because I jump right into three. Because I'm really between the two, just trying to contrast the, the two different functions here, whether we're using the uh, linear ODE solver or the general ODE solver. And uh, this one is a, see, yeah, I guess we haven't hit on this model yet, have I? No. Uh, we're going to model uh, some, some drug-induced neutropenia. And I'm just going to do a single patient here for this one. Uh, it's, so it's going to involve some nonlinear ODEs. Uh, we've got multiple dosing of our drug Me Too here. Uh, and here you can see the outlines of the couple of profiles, a <coughs> couple of times when ex extensive profiles were <coughs> sampled, and then a bunch of troughs. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, the neutrophil counts. <coughs> and uh, also notice the, uh, the x-axis. Notice this goes out to about 200. That goes out to about 600. So the fall-off here is certainly significantly delayed relative to these more rapid changes in the plasma concentration in here. And the approach we're going to use here is a uh, is going to be using the uh, Freiberg Carlson semi mechanistic model for drug induced myelosuppression. Uh, in fact I stole the picture out of one of their references here. Uh, so we're basically modeling the maturation of this of these neutrophils from some you know from some germ cell uh, where the, the underlying cells are being proliferated over here, thus PROL, uh, and then going through a maturation process by using these transit compartments until finally you reach the observed neutrophils in the, uh, circ in the circulation, which is the circ uh, in this model. I just realized pointing at this does you no good at all, does it? Okay. Uh, so we've got that. And so you've got that basic notion of that maturation process in here. Uh, we're going to assume the rate constants for all the transitions here are equal. Uh, and you can, from that, you can calculate an overall mean transit time going from the proliferation compartment to the circulated uh, neutrophils. Uh, and we're just going to, and in our model, the, um, well, first of all, there's a uh, a feedback occurring according to this relationship here. And then the drug effect itself is going to be back here on the, uh, on the proliferation of our germ cells down here. Uh, so basically the drug effect happens back here and then stuff happens and it takes time for the stuff to happen and then you observe the uh, changes uh, in the neutrophil counts. Um, in, so the model for just the PD component of this then uh, involves, uh, for our case, where we have those three intervening transition, um, uh, transition compartments here is going to be five uh, ODEs. We tack on that our three ODEs for our PK model, and we've got a system of eight ODEs here. 
Uh, we do have some nonlinear elements in here uh, that crop up up here. If it wasn't for this stinker, we could use the, uh, the linear ODE one, but they're there, so we're stuck with it. Uh, in addition, this is an instance that illustrates a place where it would be logical to use some informative priors because the parameters I marked out in reds are one that, could, that we could argue are system parameters. They're kind of related to the underlying physiology and, are, and we believe are drug independent. Uh, therefore, we could use information that was learned from past experience with other drugs uh, or even for non-drug things where you're looking at, uh, at the neutrophil maturation process to inform our priors that we use for the various model parameters, for those model parameters, again, highlighted in red. But then there's also some things that are drug-specific uh, in this. Most of them turn out to be drug-independent, but as part of the e-drug, we have... In this particular case, we're just going to use a simple linear model for that as a function of the plasma concentration. But alpha is very drug specific. And thus, if we've not had experience with this drug yet, we would probably use a pretty uninformative, or at least weekly, maybe a weekly informative uh, prior for something like that. Yeah. So anyway, the full set of um, <coughs> full set of ODEs is written here. Uh, now, I've written this out in a way where, again, I've used the trick to introduce non-zero initial conditions, particularly non-zero ones where I want to estimate uh, the initial conditions. Uh, I've used a change variable where, for some of these parameters, I use the difference from baseline. Uh, and in this particular model, uh, the way it's set out, if you look at it, the steady state, I'm going to assume steady state for the system before we introduce the drug. And at steady state, all of the, uh, all of the parameter, all of, sorry, all of the compartments here uh, would actually have the same concentration. Uh, so they end what I'll call circ sub zero in the model. Uh, so you see that for all of those components there, you see that X4 is going to be changed from baseline for all of them. And the baseline is the same, circa zero. Uh, the KTR in there, we can relate to that mean transit time. So mean transit time is actually going to be the thing we'll put a prior on. And K, the KTR is something we can estimate from it, calculate directly from it. And underlying that, so what we said about the logic here where we you know, we've got some system parameters for which we already have good prior information, so we're going to use informative priors for those and use, uh, you know, and use more weekly informative priors for, uh, for the things that aren't, like alpha, uh, as part of this. And that's going to be, and the model's there, but let's see what happened to our uh, previous case. Did it behave? No obvious errors there. No, nothing awful. In fact, not much of anything going on there. This one actually is not very much information. Uh, sometimes what you'll see with Stan is some of the earlier iterations will have various errors often associated with some uh, situation where the model has temporarily kind of wandered outside the constraints or something like that. And if that only happens a little, you know, if you have a small number of those that happen early on in the iteration process, feel free to ignore them. But if they get particularly numerous and continue, I would stop things and take a look and see what's going wrong. That's often an indicator of things like uh, maybe you're the, the range of a given prior you've given and the constraint you specified when you declared the variable might be inconsistent, for example. You know, so if you said, okay, I want you to put a prior of uh, uniform, you know, 0, 10 on some value, but you declared the, the thing to only have a lower bound of 0 with no upper bound, that's going to cause some grief, for example, sometimes. Okay, so where we were going to go with that, so we're going to take a look. So that was called neutropenia single patient one. Let's take a peek at that. 
actually let's go to this model file model folder yeah trouble when you enlarge everything uh, did I pull it up yes I did we're okay luckily I got the right one Okay, so the first thing I need to do uh, in this, well, I won't, it doesn't have to be the first thing, but one of the things I need to do is specify that system of ordinary differential equations. Again, with Torsten, the syntax for specifying the ordinary differential equations is the same as specifying it when you're doing it directly with the OD solvers in, uh, in STAN. Uh, so it's same. So you've got to return a real array First argument is it has to be a scalar for the time, and then the rest of them are arrays. Uh, the first two are real arrays, uh, one for the uh, you know for the values of the different states, or in our case, the amounts in each compartment. Uh, one containing the parameters, and then if we're going to pass any uh, any data values in, uh, then those get passed in in the next two. And this is another example where I'm not doing that. Uh, here, I'm, ex I'm both declaring some names that we recognize here and, and grabbing the corresponding values in the parameters array. By the way, I guess a comment here, <laughs> this is a sort of a matter of personal style again. You could actually do all the calculations just writing everything in terms of the elements of POMS. Uh, in here and never doing this intermediate assignment and never declaring any of these, but you might find it hard to read and certainly somebody else will probably find it pretty hard to read. So this is, so I argue for this more as a matter of, a, a matter of style to improve readability. Uh, so we go through all of those uh, and make the assignments. Got a few intermediate things we're going to calculate here. Uh, <coughs> you know, my uh, microscopic ray constants over here I'll generate. Um, my derivatives here, and I know I'm going to have eight of them, so I'm going to do that. Uh, my concentration is going to be obtained by just the amount in the second compartment divided by V1. Uh, I can go ahead and even do the drug effect calculation here, which is just going to be alpha times concentration. And actually, I didn't tell the truth when I specified the model entirely. It's not actually purely linear. It's linear, it's linear to a maximum. So think of this as being like a poor man's Emacs. You know, it's basically going up linearly and then flattening off at one for that, which is kind of a cheater's way of dealing with the asymptote. Uh, but it probably only makes sense if you don't think you're likely to reach the asymptote. Uh, however, when you're doing sampling in a system like this, it's not unusual for the parameters to wander off into a region where you actually would hit that asymptote. And if you don't stick this term in here with the F min and max it out at the asymptote, it will fail. As I discovered the hard way where I started, kept, I kept on failing, I kept on scratching my head wondering what heck went, went wrong. And I finally realized that, oh, this didn't make sense. It, without that, it didn't make sense. And did that, and all of a sudden, magic, it happens. So, so we got there. Okay, so in here I deal with the fact that uh, for some of my things I would like to be working directly with the untransformed parameters because keep in mind my x's were in turn for some of these parameters were changed from baseline. So here I'm calculating the original values back again. So my, for my proliferation compartment it's x4 plus the baseline and so on for all of these right up to and including uh, the, uh, our circ here. Um, uh, this is another, this is a bit of bulletproofing that I, I ran into some problems where occasionally when, you know, for some of the samples it would reach a point where it drove, it basically drove the, uh, value, drove the value for CERC down to the point where it actually got negative. Uh, and for some of the subsequent calculations, if it's negative, it's going to behave very badly because you're going to be trying to take an expon, you know, an, you're trying to exponentiate a negative value, and it doesn't like that. Uh, so this was just kind of forcing the issue. Uh, it also 
uh, it was also a place where it was dividing by it would where it was also dividing by the value, and if it hit zero, that would also be a problem. Thus, the Racine precision rather than zero is the is the bottom. Okay. Anyway, that's bulletproofing. Um, okay, the usual two compartment model, and then all of the uh, these are just the derivatives for all of my uh, transform parameters over here, uh, and using exactly the things we saw in the slides before. You know, and after populating those, just returning uh, that array of derivatives. Um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, not a lot new here. Uh, There's a little bit more bookkeeping because the sampling times for the PK data and the sampling times for the PD data were different. So while I had, excuse me, <coughs> okay, uh, while while I, the total, so I've got a total number of um, you know of events here included. Uh, the subset that contains PK observations and the subset that includes PD are different. So I have an NOBS PK and an NOBS PD and a corresponding IOBS component for each of those to deal with that bookkeeping. In here, uh, you know, and you can see, for example, the COBS and the NUTOBS here for our concentrations and the neutrophil counts have different numbers of elements in there. Uh, in this example, I chose to pass the priors in, the, the parameters of the priors in as data. Uh, you know, it, it provides a, you know, and again, this is kind of a style issue. I could have hard-coded them in here, uh, or I could uh, do this in, or specify them in R and then pass them in. This is I just illustrating the way you can do it that way, where you I actually wrote them all out in R and then passed them in as a way to if you want to sort of have the control at the R level instead of the stand level, you can do that. Uh, particularly if you want to do like a sensitivity analysis, that comes in handy because you could generate sort of multiple cases right within R and deal with them there. That's it for the data, transform data. Did I do anything of interest there? Uh, oh, I take it I didn't specify. I guess I didn't specify some of the uh, sort of non memish elements I didn't specify, so I just dealt with them here uh, because they were kind of trivial, like rate, I, I, EDL, and SS were all things that I just were going to be using zeros in anyway, so it was just as easy to just stuff it all in there. Uh, here we've got some transformations because I'm doing log normals on all of these. Um, okay, that's we've done that before. Those again, I'm using the uh, default values for F and T lag. I'm using the uh, the trick for constraining Ka again. I think the rest of that's pretty much same old, same old. Uh, and in transform parameters, uh, most of this is kind of the same as before. Uh, you know, doing the usual things of uh, you know setting up a few things for holding my predicted values here, my uh, predicted amounts in each compartment. Got my parameters component here, and where I package up all of the parameters that I want to pass. Uh, and then finally, the statement here again. It's much like the other Torsten statements here, except now I'm using the general ODE model, where in this case the first argument is actually the function containing my differential equations. Uh, so let's see, after that it looks pretty much like the old analytical solutions for one and two compartment model, uh, but you have to pass that. Oh, and the next one is for the number of compartments, or if you prefer the number of differential equations. Uh, and then once I get those out, then you know, con my predicted concentration, again, is just second compartment amount divided by V1. And the neutrophils are, remember that the, uh, the eighth component there was the neutrophil count minus the initial neutrophil count. So I have to add the initial value back in. That's 
think. Yeah, that's kind of most of the tail right there. Uh, you know, and this, in the model, I don't think there was anything unique. Oh, I guess for the informative things, one thing I did differently here is I explicitly use the log normals for a bunch of these. So you can see those. So I did that rather than using transforms to do that. And the rest is old news. Yeah, nothing particularly new there. Okay, uh, I can't remember the time it takes on these, because the ones that involve ODE solvers do take a significant amount of time, uh, at least those that involve the, uh, the general ODE solvers. Uh, for the single patient, not too bad. When we get to multiple patients, they get quite large, and we'll talk about issues surrounding that, actually. Hopefully, we'll get to some of that. Because uh, we there are things we're trying to do to improve upon that situation. Now that was actually going to be a break point. Any uh, any questions or comments you want to make before we take maybe a I don't know fifteen minute break? Okay, why don't we? Oh, did I see a hand pop up all of a sudden? It's over there. Yeah. Um, one question. So, how, based on your experience, how complex can you want to do this? How many patients do you have to do this? Oh, well, the feasible is the key word yeah. in that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I can implement. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but at this stage, uh, well, it would depend on more than just number of equations. It's, it's a combination. Uh, it's basically the overall dimensionality that comes into it as much as anything else. Number of equations will just sort of part of that picture. Uh, uh, because, you know, doing, you know, for like a, a non-hierarchical model, I could probably be somewhat ambitious, you know, on the order of tens of equations in here for something like that, uh, depending on how many parameters are in that model. Uh, but the minute I start adding multiple in, a hierarchy with multiple individuals where I have to not where I have to run that that solver for each one of those, plus I've got this increased dimensionality resulting from all the random effects that gets generated by that hierarchy. Uh, then it fairly quickly gets a, a pretty strong limit. So, you know, I, if I have, you know, even four or five equa differential equations, but I've got a couple hundred patients uh, at the moment, uh, depending on how many random effects you have in there, that, that could exceed any reasonable feasibility. Uh, also, feasibility depends upon your context, okay? If I'm uh, okay, for instance, for you, does feasibility mean a runtime of minutes, hours, days, you know, things like that? So, for example, there may be academic contexts where days and maybe even weeks might be workable, depending upon what you're trying to achieve. If you're working in an industrial context where, you know, or you, whether it be academic or industrial, where you've got a deadline, and you have to actually do multiple models in order to discriminate between models, all of a sudden, you know, days starts to get to be a real problem. And so feasibility, you know, where you draw the line of feasibility changes. So, so anyway, that was a long-winded way of saying it depends, but, uh, you know, but certainly, you know, if, you, if I was dealing with a model that had, you know, 30 equations, you know, 30, ODEs in here, and I had to use the nonlinear solver in there, uh, and I've got a deadline, a fairly tight deadline. I got a problem. Uh, we're actually, hopefully, we'll get to this, but we're, we'll talk a bit about some of the things we're trying to change to start making those things feasible. Because the ambition is to actually make Stan a feasible option in contexts like QSP, where you're often dealing with fairly large scale systems of ODEs and. Uh, even possibly things like PDEs uh, in there. So the idea is to make it feasible for that, but it's certainly not there. Yeah. And 
the things that we're looking at are different inference engines, uh, different type categories of parallel processing, things like that, to try and try and deal with that. Um, one one other question. Um, say for the classical poppy K analysis and all them, you have to develop a way to uh, search specify individual variability, uh, which parameters you put it and which parameters you don't. So um, in some you typically well, the specify is fully or uh, my default is usually to start with with random effects on I, I'm trying to figure out how far to go with this, uh, but uh, I, I tend my bias is towards including random effects on more things and including all the off diagonal things. And with sampling methods like these, often that's not too bad. Uh, optimization methods tend to have more problems. You know where you you know where uh, the maximum likelihood estimate may actually be zero for things. You know when you know it doesn't make any sense. Uh, physically, yeah, that's just kind of the way the optimization, uh, you know, the maximum likelihood estimate just does that. Uh, whereas if you're actually trying to sample a posterior, you often get something far more reasonable uh, in terms of saying something about the inter-individual variation. Uh, you know, even when things are what you might normally think of as being over-parameterized in, in an optimization context. So anyway, the short answer is my bias is generally to include is to include random effects on more of the parameters and you know and include the off diagonal elements in my covariance matrix. Thank you. Yes. Um, and if you were to uh, wanted to compare a model where you have this random effect and a model where you don't have that random effect. Mm -hmm. uh, JAX or Windows will give you like a DIC. Mm -hmm. And Stan doesn't? It doesn't directly. Uh, there is a package called Loop, L O O, which <laughs> was short for Leave One Out, uh, that is a post processing uh, tool to apply to, the, um, to what you generate out of Stan for calculating uh, a couple of things. Uh, you can generate a, a Leave One Out uh, cross validation index. Uh, that, that, that's that, which is an attempt at sort of estimating an out of sample variation. Uh, it's an alternative to that. It also generates something called a, uh, well, it depends who you talk to. It's either a Watanabe Akaiki information criteria or a widely available information criteria. They're all, they're both WAIC, so it works. And, uh, and that's another one uh, that's used. Uh, WAIC would be a little bit more like a DIC uh, than the, you can, you can actually generate from that LOO estimate, you can convert it into an information criteria form, uh, which it does. Anyway, so you can use that. They also actually estimate an uncertainty in those information criteria so that you can actually start making some characterization on, you know, when you're looking at two values for a couple of different models, you know, whether or not those differences are actually meaningful differences between them. Uh, in them. So, so it does, so even though it's not built into STAM per se, there are tools, and that by the way also comes out of the STAM team that developed it. That I think, um, yeah, I think Aki Vitari did most of that. Anyway. And by the way, that's what I resort to. If I, if I break down to the point where I've got to do you know, model extermination, that's usually where I It's a mix of that and, and the visual checks of various kinds. Okay, so be back. Let's call it four. <laughs>